good number. So I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. Welcome, everybody. Um, glad to have you here today at our webinar, um, which is an overview of the current public consultation on proposed updates to the VCS program. Uh, my name is Nicole Shermer. I am the manager of VCS program development. And today I'll be joined by several of my colleagues who will each introduce themselves um, as they speak. So before we kick it off, I'm going to go over some quick housekeeping items. So the webinar today is being recorded and the recording will be made available online after today. Questions throughout the webinar can be submitted in the Q&A function. You should be able to find that on the bottom menu of your Zoom screen. We will answer questions at the end, but do feel free to post them in the Q&A chat throughout the webinar. Uh, if we are not able to get to your question today, even though we will, we will try, um, but you're welcome to follow up with us directly at programupdates at vera.org, uh, the email inbox, and that will show up on the screen at the very end of the webinar. I think that is all for housekeeping items. So I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. So the objective of today's webinar is to provide an overview of the public consultation um, proposed updates to the VCS program, which was released on the 27th of June, 2023, and is active until the end of this month. The webinar um, objective is also to answer any stakeholder questions about the public consultation, how to participate, and any of the content. I'll just give us a quick overview of the agenda planned for today. After this, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Justin Wheeler, who will um, tell us about the consultation timeline and logistics, including how to participate in the consultation and send feedback. Then each of my colleagues will provide an overview of the proposed updates that are included in the consultation. And each of their sessions will cover some key background information about the updates, it will go into some details on the proposed changes themselves, and it will be a quick overview of the requested feedback that we're looking for and why. Finally, we'll have a Q&A session at the end, which we hope to reserve about 15 minutes for. The total webinar runtime is expected to be about 60 minutes, but if we don't end up needing to use all of that time, we will give you back a few minutes of your day. So. I think that does it for the introductory slides, and I'm going to hand it over to Justin. Thanks, Nicole. Um, and hi, everyone. My name is Justin Wheeler. I'm the Senior Director of VCS Program Development. Um, so this is the overview of the timeline for this update. As Nicole just mentioned, the consultation was initiated on the 27th of June and runs until the 31st of this month. Um, Today is the webinar, obviously. We have quite a quick turnaround for this update. Um, so we are analyzing the responses as they come in, and we encourage you to submit your consultation responses as soon as you can. Um, we're reviewing the comments and finalizing the proposals for a, a planned release in late August. Um, the reason for that is August is the next deadline for uh, Corsia submission and, and evaluation, and the VCS has received conditional approval for the first phase compliance. We have full approval for the pilot phase, um, and we anticipate that these updates will enable full acceptance, and we want to get that done as soon as possible. Go to the next slide, Nicole. Um, so a reminder that the um, preferred way to receive comments for this consultation are through the online form. It's a Google form. Um, the link is on the consultation website. Um, and if you don't have it, feel free to ask a question. We can post it in a, in a response. Um, the, the form is very simple. It's just two pages. One is your basic info. And then the second page is the responses to all the questions. It saves as you go. Um, and you can close it and come back to it and your, your content will be there as long as you're signed in to a, a Google account. 
Um, and then once you click submit is when it, it shows up for us. Um, there is also a PDF document posted on the consultation website that shows the, all of the proposed changes and the questions. Um, so that you can use that when you're preparing your responses before you submit them in the form. Um, if you have any issues with the Google form, please feel free to reach up, reach out to us at programupdates at vera.org. Um, but please use the form if at all possible, especially because of the tight turnaround. It just helps us process the comments much more quickly. So here's a here's a preview of the form. This is what you'll see once you click into the to the link. So it just gives some basic information about uh, who you are filling it out. There's a an option at the bottom of this list that lets you choose whether you would like your feedback to be shared with attribution to you and your organization or uh, to be shared anonymously. Um, so feel free to make your choice. We we do plan to publish all comments received unless, of course, they're um, totally off topic or something like that. But um, any legitimate comments to the questions asked will be published along with responses, potentially summary responses, depending if we get a lot of similar similar questions. Um, so I'm sure many of you use, have used these types of forms before, but like I said, please feel free to reach out if you have, have questions to our program update inbox, program updates at vera.org. Um, so just before we dive into the content, a reminder, um, this consultation is coming from a few different places. So um, we did the open consultation earlier this year um, that collected kind of wide open feedback on the VCS program. So some of the proposed updates do follow up from, from comments received. Um, some of them are follow-ups from uh, internally identified updates that need to be made. So as we're reviewing projects or managing the system, uh, we identify things that need to be updated. Some of the updates are completions of previously consulted updates. So you don't see those in the consultation doc or this webinar because they were previously consulted on um, other than the NPRT, which we have a few further changes that we're consulting again on before we release it. Um, and then the final purpose is of course, to enable acceptance for Corsia and ICVCM. So some of the updates come from the requirements uh, from those, those organizations. So we can go to the next slide and I'll hand it over to Anna uh, to present an overview of the proposed updates to the safeguards. Thanks, Justin. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Mortimer. I am the, I'm a senior program officer on the VCS program development team. Um, so I'm going to speak a bit about the updates of VCS safeguards. So we have made some updates or proposed some updates to the VCS safeguards, including stakeholder engagement, which are related to the ICVCM criteria for the CCP label. Uh, we've also made a few additional updates. I wanna to touch briefly on the restructure of the safeguards. So if you look at the previous versions of the VCS standard, you will see just an overall safeguard section. Um, we've now proposed to separate that into specifically safeguards and then safe um, stakeholder engagement. Because there is significant structure change, um, we have also in the consultation document highlighted the specific new proposed updates in green so that it's clear what is new in terms of new language uh, versus what already existed within the standard. I want to also touch on that we believe that at this point in time, um, this is actually more of just an expansion of the concept of no net harm. So these concepts, these new safeguards, would we consider just part of the overall concept of no net harm, um, but they are for compliance with ICBCM criteria. Within the new updates, uh, we have broken out safeguards to include risks to stakeholders in the environment, respect for human rights and equity, ecosystem health and property rights within stakeholder engagement. Um, we have stakeholder engagement and consultation, uh, free prior and informed consent, and public comments. We have also removed the heading of AFLU specific safeguards as we have expanded all these safeguards to apply to all activity types. However, where there is a specific safeguard requirement that may not apply to your activity type, there will be the possibility or the option to report as not applicable. Um, 
we have also added specific requirements related to the usage of invasive species and non-native species, um, including several new definitions, which we are looking for feedback on. Projects are now going to be required to demonstrate no negative impacts through a risk assessment where potential negative impacts exist. The project is going to now demonstrate mitigation activities uh, to prevent said impact. Next slide, please. Um, so here are the updated sections. As I mentioned, we now have two new sections. We have safeguards and stakeholder engagement rather than one safeguard section. Next slide, please. So the feedback that we are looking for on these updates, the proposed updates, is specifically the usability of these proposed updates. Um, the new structure, whether or not separating out safe, um, safeguards and stakeholder engagement makes sense, if the, the subheadings make sense, if the grouping of the uh, updates makes sense. Um, any resources or guidance that Vera could provide to VVBs and project proponents that are now applying these proposed updates and then assessing them. Um, any additional resources that VERA should review uh, in improving the proposed updates, and then any additional safeguards uh, that we could include or any way we could strengthen the proposed updates that have been drafted. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Candice. Thanks, Anna. Uh, so I'm Ken Spinky. I'm the Senior Director of Nature-Based Innovation uh, at VERA. And uh, I'm going to go over some of the permanence updates. So as you may already know, we were, were in the midst of an update to the non-permanence risk tool when we released this consultation. Um, that consultation, it was posted in, in February 2022, and it was primarily focused on updating the natural risk section uh, to account for future impacts of climate change and sea level rise. And those changes are, are still moving forward and uh, an updated fully digital version of the tool will be released in August. But while we were working on the final touches, there were a, a few additional items that we felt we should consult on. And, and that's why we posted these items for consultation in this proposed update. So um, there are several issues that the proposed update addresses. The first is it changes having an adaptive management plan from a mitigation measure to a mandatory requirement. Uh, the reason for this is we feel that uh, all projects should have a plan for identifying, assessing, and mitigating, mitigating reversal risk factors, and that these, these plans should include a process for monitoring progress and, and adjusting as needed. And then second, it added, or it introduces an added withholding for projects that have previously failed to submit the loss reports at times. So right now, projects have up to, to two years to submit the report after the loss event is detected, but there isn't really a consequence for, for not following through on this other than, um, you know, maybe being continuously pestered by us. And, and this has been a bit problematic. So we introduced this as a, a consequence for not meeting this timeline. And then third, uh, it includes an added withholding for countries or jurisdictions with a history of uh, state land or resource use intervention. Um, and the reason for this is that there, there is an added permanence risk if projects are terminated early uh, due to, to government intervention. And then next, the net positive social and economic impacts mitigation measure under the stakeholder engagement uh, section was removed. Um, uh, this is because this is basically an expectation of projects now and therefore it doesn't make sense for it to, to be a mitigation measure anymore. And then last, we proposed increasing both the project longevity and minimum crediting period requirements for AFLU projects to 40 years. Um, the proposed, uh, this is a proposed to sort of increase the minimum amount of time that projects will be monitored actively. And then we also changed the, the formulas for calculating the project longevity withholding so that projects with longevity of less than 100 years uh, cannot receive a, a zero score. Um, next slide, please. So the impacted documents are the AFLU non-permanence risk tool and the VCS standard. Uh, in the non-permanence risk tool, the proposed changes are made in section 2.2, internal risks, and section 2.3, uh, external risks. And then in the standard, section 3.2 on AFLU specific matters and section 3.9 um, project crediting period have uh, some proposed changes as well. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so we have several questions on these updates that we're hoping to get feedback on. Um, first of all, we're wondering whether the withholdings uh, for a country or jurisdiction with a history of national, subnational, or local government intervention uh, in land or resource use are appropriate uh, and whether or not the value should be higher or lower if they're not. Um, we're also wondering if we should increase the maximum external risk threshold in the non permanence risk tool, which is, is currently set at 20. Um, because of these proposed changes. Um, the next question is whether or not we should add an extra withholding for projects that have experienced a past non-catastrophic, which under our definitions is an avoidable reversal, and if so, how much should that withholding be? And then we were also considering another alternative to increasing the minimum crediting period to 40 years. So we've posed that as a question. Um, basically, we were thinking about giving projects two options. First of all, maybe they could voluntarily commit to initial crediting period of 40 years or alternatively adopt a minimum, minimum crediting period of 20 years and then sign an agreement with us to monitor and compensate for reversals for at least 40 years. So we were wondering which option you prefer and why. And then if we were to introduce the second option, um, how should reversals be quantified in the post crediting period? Uh, for example, should they be based on net accounting um, since the project entered its post crediting period? And then if a reversal occurs, uh, how should projects replenish the buffer pool? Uh, you know, For example, project proponents could be required to provide credits from their other projects or purchase credits from the broader market. So those are some of the key questions that we had in relation to this um, agreement option. Um, and then again, whether or not this should be different for unavoidable and avoidable reversals. And then last, um, we have a broader question about exploring non-permanence risk insurance. Uh, we know that some projects already uh, have some types of insurance and we're considering making this a requirement or an optional mitigation measure in the non-permanence risk tool. So we're wondering what people think of that. And I think that's it for me. So I will uh, stop there and I believe it's over to Ian next. Thanks, Candice. So my name is Ian Kuehara. I'm Director of Industrial and Energy Innovations here at Vera, and I'm going to be talking about two updates today. Uh, the first one is related to updates to requirements for project uh, construction and upstream emissions. So uh, the intent here is to improve the quantification accuracy and overall integrity of the program, and it would be done by including emissions that currently are uh, dismissed or excluded from project project boundaries, uh, in particular for industrial and energy or non-AFLU projects. Uh, but uh, it is a program-wide update that we're considering. Um, so the revision is considering emissions when they're not approximately equivalent between the baseline and project scenarios. So that's a key distinction that I think we can make clear in any uh, updates to the requirements. They're not de minimis, and I think we'll talk a little bit about that in uh, the questions on the next slide. And then they may occur during or prior to the project start. And that's important because uh, it's a little bit of a novelty in the BCS to actually have uh, including emissions upstream of the or before the project start. And then lastly, we would uh, anticipate having conservative and simplified guidance so that it's not too much of a burden for proponents to be determining these emissions. Uh, there's been talk of sort of things like life cycle analysis or the need for life cycle analysis. And I think we'd be looking to minimize the, the increased administrative burden by providing some simple factors in particular for things like steel and concrete for industrial and energy related projects. Um, this change in general is being driven by the considerations and work that we're doing related to GCS or geological carbon sequestration projects through the CCS Plus initiative. And it will be implemented most likely through changes in the VCS methodology requirement document. Uh, it may be included in the uh, update later in uh, Q3 of this year, or it may, may not, and uh, may be refined in uh, version five, which I think is early next year uh, in terms of the schedule. And I don't think any specific changes have been proposed yet. The consultation document did include uh, commentary around moving one requirement from an AFLU section to the more general section, which I think is part and parcel of this change. 
uh, but we're still thinking about uh, how to go about this and interested in understanding what comments or concerns stakeholders have, hence the consultation. So next slide, please. So here um, we've got a number of questions related to this. As you can see, we're very curious. I won't read them all. I'll just highlight a few. Uh, these are identical to what was proposed in the public consultation document itself from the PDF, so you can revisit these later on the website if you're interested. But in particular, number two is interesting. We're, uh, we're, we're very curious and eager to get insight about what conditions might make this more or less relevant and how can we help refine or constrain the burden and or benefits to these, to these changes. Uh, so conditions are very important to us and we've been thinking about it. Question four highlights the idea that there is this temporal component and it's not obvious what uh, what solutions there might be to, to a problem in the uh, time dimension where we're considering accruing, effectively accruing emissions before and in the early days of uh, a project's initiation, potentially before a crediting period and how or what instructions would we provide to project stakeholders to either amortize or not amortize those emissions across either the first year, the first uh, crediting period, or, or uh, you know, potentially multiple years, depending on how those two time periods relate to each other. And then finally, question seven, I'll highlight. Uh, AFLU um, has a de minimis threshold suggested to be 5%, and we're curious whether that is appropriate, extended across all project types, and in particular with the emphasis on upstream con upstream and construction emissions. So that is all I'll say about the questions there, I think. Uh, next slide, please. Great, uh, so this update, so this is the second update I'll be talking about uh, it's related to revising the methodology revision process, and in particular, related to a standardized approach for assessing additionality, the activity penetration approach. So under the current rules for additionality, uh, you're allowed to uh, develop a standardized approach for assessing additionality, and there's a few options. Activity penetration is one in which you assess the total uh, market adoption potential of an activity and then determine that the methodology, uh, that the activity related to methodology is less than 5% of uh, total activity penetration and thus is uh, additional, de facto additional for uh, the term of the uh, methodology. And that uh, term is, uh, when it expires, you periodically or we periodically have to review and potentially revise the methodology and under the current rules as is written uh, in the um, text that's both black and struck through you can see that as the activity penetration threshold is crossed for any uh, methodology that that effectively inactivates that methodology for the rest of the time and we believe that this is a disservice its original intention was to uphold integrity for uh, additionality, but we believe that the benefits to the additionality are now unclear and that um, it may impact the viability and reduce the scale of climate action for certain activities. Again, in this case, we're thinking about geological carbon sequestration or GCS projects. Uh, these projects may span multiple uh, crediting periods. So the current rules allow five renewals and it's conceivable that a project would actually see the activity penetration exceed the threshold and invalidate that project during its lifetime. And that is an unacceptable risk and represents a barrier to action, we believe. And hence we're proposing a revision where instead of permanently inactivating the methodology, we would deactivate the methodology with the provision that it can be reactivated by a methodology revision as per the procedures in uh, MDRP or methodology development and review process document. Uh, so just sort of leaving a little bit more open-ended. Next slide, please. 
So here you can see the, the uh, changes actually have to occur twice, once in the methodology review document and once in the uh, MDRP. And so this is the change that is proposed in the MDRP or methodology development and review process document. It's in section 5.3. And next slide. So our two questions here, really what are the risks of reactivating a methodology that had originally relied on activity penetration as a way of demonstrating additionality and that that, that sector or activity has since exceeded that 5% threshold? Um, and then are there project types, specific project types or methodologies even that you see this change having an impact on either for the better or for the worse in your opinion and how? So with that, I'll turn it over to Justin, I believe, who will kick off our Q&A. Hey, okay, thanks everyone for the questions. Some of them we're answering live, but we're gonna read out a few here. Um, just a couple of logistical ones that were answered in type, but are maybe worth reiterating. Um, so the comment period is open until the 31st. We will be accepting responses on the 31st and we'll um, just go to midnight Eastern time um, on that day. So if you're in another time zone, you can uh, adjust accordingly. Um, and then there was another question on where will these updates show up? So other than the one Ian mentioned on upstream emissions where we're, we're still deciding based on the consultation whether uh, we make this update for 4.5 or version 5. All of the other updates are proposed for version 4.5 at this time. So we have a bunch of other feedback from the open consultation that's being rolled into the version 5 um, planning. And of course, some of these things may, may have further revision in version 5 as we tackle some of those other changes. But this consultation is specifically for version 4.5. Um, so the the first question was on grandfathering for current projects. Um, th there was one question specific to the 30 year and then a more general question on grandfathering and grace periods. So anytime we uh, change a requirement, unless it's really extenuating circumstances like a key integrity risk, um, we do typically provide a grace period for those updates. Feel free to comment on that in your responses, what sort of grace periods would be needed. This is a little bit of an odd timing for an update compared to our usual. Um, usually, usually we like to have our grace periods uh, end with the calendar year or half calendar year. Um, so our, our current kind of working proposal is that we would have most of these requirements take effect January 1st of the coming year. Um, but like I said, please feel free to provide comments on that and there may be exceptions to that. That's just the general thinking uh, currently. So I think we'll start with, um, there's a question related to agricultural and land management projects, Candace, about the training plan requirements and whether Vera will provide additional guidance or templates. Do you want to speak to that one? Yeah, I'm not sure actually which update or which requirement that's referring to. It's not in this update. I believe it's in the oh, previous okay. update in February 2022. And I believe what the question is referring to is one of the mitigation measures we have um, in that consultation that was giving an option if you um, uh, sort of educate stakeholders to mitigate your risk. But I, I sent them a private message to try to clarify okay. what it was referring to. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then there's one on the SD updates and the implications for combined projects that are using uh, CCB. Anna or Sinclair, do you want to speak to that? Sure, yeah. Um, so the update shouldn't dramatically impact uh, projects that are using both the CCB program and the VCS program. However, where there are requirements um, now included in the VCS program that are not covered by the CCB program, those projects will still be able, will still be required to adhere to and report on those new VCS requirements. And we will be updating all of our program templates as, as usual um, for this update, including the combined 
templates. Um, okay, the next question was around longevity for Candice. So does the new project longevity need to be supported by contracts? If yes, um, this may become a challenge for smallholder projects. Speak to that. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. And I think that that question's asked three times um, in different ways um, in questions. So I think it's an important one. So the increase in project longevity and monitoring requirements does not require you to have contracts of equivalent duration with each individual landowner. So if you're implementing an aggregated project or a grouped project with multiple smallholders, we're not proposing that you need to have a 40 year contract with every individual landowner. What we're proposing is that the project proponent at the group level would be making this commitment. Uh, and then you would have to manage uh, your project as a whole to ensure 40 year longevity. Great, thanks Candice. There's a couple things that were asked here as questions, but they're, they're actually comments. Um, so please, if you do have comments, we're, I mean, we will review the questions, but it's much more likely that your comments will be considered if you put them in the template and, and submit them as a response to the proposed update. So we, we really do want your feedback, but putting comments in the Q&A doesn't really uh, get it to us as, as effectively. So we do encourage you to submit your, your comments through the consultation form. Um, Okay, sorry, just skimming the questions. We have a lot coming in. So there's a, a question on the the driver for the change in the longevity and and crediting time. Um, Candice, do you want to speak to that? So it's what are the I'll just <laughs> edit a little bit as I read. I think there's a typo. What are the drivers of increased longevity and crediting time? Does it consider benefits for communities? Um, what about species that reach their maximum growth rate before 30 years? Uh, and then there was another variation on that that asked about ALM projects. Right, yeah, so there's a few different drivers for the increase. One, we wanted to align the project longevity requirement with the, the minimum crediting period requirements because that's a constant source of confusion that it was historically 20 years and 30 years. Uh, another reason is that we just wanted to increase the time frame which projects are actively monitoring uh, for reversals to help ensure um, that our permanent goal of 100 years is, is achieved. Um, we are in the process of developing our long-term monitoring system, as you may already know, and in the longer term, our vision is, is that that monitoring responsibility would shift over to VERA. But in the interim, uh, we wanted to, to increase these timeframes to increase the, the length of time that active monitoring is taking place to increase confidence in the permanence of those projects. Uh, and also considering um, um, some potential uh, changes with uh, ICBCM in terms of longevity, we thought that this would, would help move in the right direction. Great, thanks Candice. Uh, so there's a question on the upstream emissions. Um, there's a few similar ones, but will upstream emissions be accounted for also for a FOLU projects? Ian, do you want to take this or do you want me to speak to it? Sure. Um, yeah, so the simple answer I think is yes, we'd be extending these requirements to all project types. Uh, the, the, the current requirements for AFALU are actually already a little bit more inclusive just by virtue of the definition of when an AFALU project starts relative to the definition of when a non-AFALU project starts. So I think the impact on AFLU project types is actually probably lower than the non-AFLU types, if that helps. Yeah, and maybe one other thing to add is this is proposed as a new methodology requirement. So it would be the methodology that has to consider the relevant sources and sync uh, to be included and the, the de minimis um, test would apply to the upstream emissions. So there may be quite a few project types where there are very minor sources of upstream emissions and they're below the de minimis threshold and the methodology uh, ends up deciding not to include them for that for that reason. So don't necessarily think of that as every single project having to do with 
really extensive calculation of really tiny upstream or downstream emission sources. Okay. Um, sorry, just skimming through. Um, as the assessment of de minimis for upstream and construction emissions could be done during methodology development, would the existing methodology be updated with these requirements? So yeah, that's what I was just speaking to. Yes, this would be uh, considered in the methodology development or updates. Um, a couple more comments on the 40 years. So there's a maybe a specific grace period question, but it's worth talking through as an example. If we plan to submit a, a PDD, uh, a project description for the ARR methodology, the afforestation, reforestation, revegetation methodology, at the end of 2023, beginning of 2024, do we need to include all of the approved changes uh, to the VCS standard that will be published this August? Um, so that'll be depend on the timing of your of your planned um, registration request. Um, but yeah, if if you're going into 2024 when you're uh, submitting for registration and validation, um, then some of these changes potentially will impact your project. But like I said, please feel free, especially if you have specific project examples um, where some of these changes might be particularly disruptive and you need a specific grace period, please include that in comment responses. Um, will there be guidance provided for WRC projects applying the sea level rise requirement in the new version of the NPRT before the updates to VM33 are finalized since the existing methodologies already include quantification of GHG impact from sea level rise. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm a little slow. It looks like we answered that one live or answered it in typing. Um, okay, team, I'm losing track a little bit, so feel free to jump in if you have particular questions that you want to answer. Um, there's another one related to longevity. If project proponents are supposed to monitor project longevity, there should be baseline allocation available for the period with the baseline revision every six years and possibility of diminishing baseline. There may be no carbon revenue. In such cases, how can a project proponent ensure longevity? Candice, do you want to, it's more of a comment, but it's maybe worth responding to because we have a few similar ones. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I follow the question on this one. It's not totally clear to me. So I think it would be best to, to respond in writing. Um, okay. The person who submitted that question could try to clarify that would be helpful and then we can follow up later. Sure. Yeah, if you have clarifications, um, feel free to either put that in your in your comments or use that email address that we mentioned, program updates at vera.org. Um, so there's a question on double counting. How will you consider double counting? Uh, for example, where, where concrete builders are claiming emissions reductions, who has the onus to prove, prove double counting? So I assume this is related to the upstream um, inclusion of the upstream emissions. Um, it, yeah. It, yeah, Ian, I don't know if you want to speak to this or. Sure, I actually answered it uh, in the chat, so I'll just quickly go over it. Um, if okay. I'm understanding the question properly, I can say first off that Vera doesn't regulate claims, so the use of these credits. And I think that the way the question structured, it may be that uh, the, the stakeholder is thinking of a situation where, say, a cement manufacturer is doing emission reductions at their facility, and by us incorporating an emissions factor or emissions accounting at a project that uses cement, there may be the potential for double counting. And as was stated, I think in the slides and maybe also in the public consultation document, uh, we're proposing simplified and um, conservative, perhaps, perhaps that wasn't stated, uh, guidance 
in the final version of this where we wouldn't be allowing proponents to take credit for emission reduction activities that are occurring sort of upstream and unrelated to their project activity. Uh, they'd be more likely to be taking uh, an, a, a simplified emission factor and that sort of, in my mind, resolves that concern. But if there's something that I'm not understanding, please feel free to either reach out again in the chat or through the comment um, submission process so that we understand better. Okay, thanks, Ian. Um, Can you please explain, so this is related to the uh, options for longevity and extended crediting period. Can you please explain option B as it relates to signing an agreement with Vera? Candace, do you want to speak to that? Oh, did we lose you? Okay, um, well, I'll try and Candace can jump in if, if I mess it up, if she's back. Um, so the, the option is an alternative to extending the crediting period and longevity period to 40 years. So this is something that's done in a few other programs um, where basically people sign an agreement with Vera and demonstrate that they have a monitoring plan in place uh, that meets that time. Oh, you're back, Candace. Do you wanna add anything to that? No, that's exactly right. Yeah. So other systems such as CAR, I think if people are familiar with CAR, I believe they have a hundred year requirement where you sign a, an implementation agreement with CAR to monitor for a hundred years. We'd be looking to do something similar, but for 40 years. Okay, thanks. Um, and of course, if, if your crediting period is longer, then you wouldn't need that requirement because you have to monitor anyway. Um, So there's a question on the, the final proposed update, Ian. When you say you want to modify the additionality criteria to be more standardized, basically in terms of activity penetration, how do you really plan to accommodate all kinds of projects under a FOLU? Um, and what about data sources and authentication for a positive list? So I, I think just looking for a little bit more detail on what this update means and which projects it applies to. Yeah. Um, so in this case, the, the proposed change is to allow for methodologies to be revised after they've reached the 5% activity penetration threshold. So it's a methodology level of requirement and, and the methodology would have previously been permanently inactivated. And with this change, we're allowing it to be revised. And so for AFLU methodologies that currently use the activity penetration approach for assessing additionality, if and when they reach that 5% threshold, instead of being permanently inactivated, they can now be revised. And so it's just a, an option for proponents who rely on that methodology to potentially be able to continue to rely on that methodology after the activity penetration uh, threshold is reached. So I hope that's clear. I don't know if it answered your question. Uh, in terms of authenticating data sources, that process is part of the methodology review or revision, which is the same process, revision and review. And there's uh, internal checks here at Vera, so the Vera review, and as well, uh, third-party uh, VVB review. That's part of that process. And so th this revision would be the same. Thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, and just to reiterate, that would only, it's a methodology requirement change, so it would only affect the methodology development process. For those using the methodology, nothing will change, um, but this allows for the methodology to have a new life if it reaches that threshold. Um, there's a couple of requests for standardized templates or guidance. Again, please put those in your, your feedback to the forms. Um, that it's really good to know the types of tools that would be useful for people. We take that quite seriously. So I encourage you to provide that feedback. 
Um, there's a question on, again, the the crediting period. How will the crediting period apply to grouped projects? Do all project activities need to meet the crediting period? Also, will this be taken in a, into account for the LTA, long-term average, as projects entering later on will have a lower LTA if they do not have the same time period for growth periods? Candice, can you speak to that one? Yeah, I think it's similar to a question that was asked earlier. So in a grouped project, it does not apply to every in individual instance. Of course, you would aim to have your instances have a duration of a minimum of 40 years, but we're not requiring contracts with individual landowners in a group project. We're just requiring the project proponent at the group level to make that commitment. So there will be updated guidance in the August version of the non permit risk tool on how you can manage permanents at the group level for um, these projects where you've got multiple uh, instances. Okay, awesome. And there were a couple other instance related questions. Um, so yeah, team, feel free to, we're running low on time, so feel free to highlight any that you really think should be answered as we go through. Um, in order to keep the conditions of the current standard version, should we be listing a project to the VERA registry? Um, yeah, so the way, it, so I mean, feel free to proceed with listing as as always. Um, it's always a good idea to to start your process as soon as possible on listing on the registry. Um, it is true that for the grace period, um, if you're already in process on the registry, then you typically meet the meet the grace period. So if you have a project that's close but you haven't yet. Uh, submitted your documents, um, planning to submit those as soon as possible uh, would allow you to proceed under the current requirements and and not be affected by these changing requirements until typically the, the crediting period. Um, there's a question on why not just require it to be 100 years. I think that's more of a, a comment, so please feel free to submit that as a comment. Um, there's a question on the change from, um, oh, I lost it now, native ecosystems versus existing ecosystems. Um, Anna, I wasn't sure if you wanted to speak to that. It, it was, I lost the question. I it think was, I have there, already res you have responded. Oh, you yeah, responded I think I responded to it in the okay. chat, yep. Okay. If, if not, there were some questions related to native ecosystems and this set of new safeguard updates that actually are better submitted as comments since it's the type of feedback that we're looking for, uh, specifically if it's related to around um, how are we defining certain terms. The definitions are located already in the consultation document. So if there's a definition that you feel is excluded or needs further clarification, please submit that as a comment. Uh, that's the kind of feedback we're looking for on these definitions. Okay, excellent, Anna. Uh, so I, I think we're coming to the end here. Most of the questions I see, I think we've already answered or they're getting very specific. Um, so just a reminder, please, if you have comments, submit them through the comment form. If you have really specific questions about your particular project, uh, feel free to reach out to us or reach out to the um, the program management team that, that is actually reviewing and approving your, your projects. Um, just looking if there's maybe one last one we should cover. Yeah, so there's the email address if you have questions on this consultation, as well as the info at Vera for more general comments. Um, and the links to all of the documents and forms are on the website. This webinar uh, and the slides will be posted there as well. Um, when will the new standard be available? I guess that's a good, good place to close. So going back to the timeline that we presented at the start, this consultation closes the 31st of July. So please get your comments in as soon as possible. We are reading them and 
and considering them as they come in. Um, but for sure by the 31st of July, because we are planning to turn around the update and have it posted um, by the end of August this year. Uh, so it's quite a quick turnaround. We're already in sort of drafting mode and considering the comments as they come. So really encourage you to get those in as soon as possible. I, I joked that we were going to ignore the last comment received just to create an incentive to come early. That's not true. We'll consider all comments. Okay. Thank you everyone for your for your time and for all the questions. Um, feel free to use those email addresses if you have further questions that we didn't quite get to that you need to have answers to to help you respond to the consultation. If there are more comments, please put them in the, the comments. And thank you again for your time and participation. This Your input is really critical to us uh, developing good program updates. So thank you very much.